Uh, so, um, <laughs> at best, we end up in the logoroic model of democracy, where you know we just uh, uh, talk, talk, and this is um, uh, is, is going to work. Uh, and I mean, to, to give you uh, an example, uh, let's take the Italians, uh, probably the most talkative uh, people in Europe, right? You can't stop them from talking. And look at what we have produced in less than a hundred years. We began with Mussolini and fascism. We had the Tangentopoli, uh, something like the institutionalized corruption system. And we ended up with Berlusconi. Uh, and with partially, the only partial exception of uh, fascism, both during Tangentopoli and during uh, the Berlusconi year, we have been talking all the time. Right? We have been saying that there was uh, uh, you know, a scandal that somebody like Berlusconi should never be in power. We were talking, but he was in power. Mm. So I think that it's a, I'm kind of being provocative, but I think it's a stark <laughs> reminder that um, democracy has to do with power, it, it has to do with Kratos, it has to do with the demos, it doesn't have to do with you know, speech. Maybe a free speech is a condition of democracy, but by far not a sufficient condition. Third point, another temptation. Uh, let's disentangle democracy from sovereignty. Why do I say so? Because otherwise we end up uh, in a, a democracy as the luxury resort that we have seen this morning, right? Uh, we uh, are uh, being democratic. Um, well, some people are out of it, and I'm sorry, you know, maybe we can host you in our luxury um, uh, resort, uh, but uh, um, there's no space for you inside. Okay? You are an outsider, and you are illegal, right? Now, one could say, well, you know, that's, this is not a good mo model, but it's the only way uh, in which we can think about um, democracy. Actually, it's even not going to work because, I mean, if uh, admitting that uh, the Aboriginal really managed to uh, create uh, something like a, a, a democratic system, if there is a, a, a tsunami caused by uh, a nuclear explosion in a, in a, in a near island and uh, uh, there is a general poisoning um, of the territory, uh, I mean, uh, this is a decision taken by somebody else which is going to have an impact uh, on, on their territory. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I think we have to disentangle democracy from sovereignty, particularly as it has been conceived uh, in, in the modern epoch, is that what has been questioned by um, globalization, or whatever name you want to give to what happened uh, on this planet in the last 30 years, is the fact that the congress between those who take the decision and the other sea of those decisions has been radically challenged. Uh, uh, there is no longer such a congruence. Uh, so that if you take a decision inside of a sovereign uh, community, uh, the accuracy of that decision are probably going to be outside uh, of that community. So we need to rethink uh, democracy outside of uh, uh, the nation uh, state, outside of uh, the modern sovereignty um, paradigm, but also consider that there is here this insistence of uh, reluctance of getting rid of sovereignty and the model of the um, sovereign state, in my view, it's particularly striking because the sovereign state is actually a very recent historical creature, right? Uh, most of the people will tell that uh, the Westphalian model began with the Peace of Westphalia, so 1648, uh, when uh, the first uh, um, sovereign state started to emerge. But the re maybe this holds for Europe, but even there I have my doubt, but this remained a strictly European experience for a very long time. The left of the world lived under empires. Uh, uh, most of the time people lived under empires. And even uh, um, France and, and, and England, they were not sovereign states. They were imperial states, right? So when has this m division of the whole world into sovereign states began? 1945, with the end of uh, um, the Second uh, uh, World War. So it's a very recent creature, uh, historically determined. I don't actually see, you know, it hasn't even done uh, only good things. 
So I don't actually see why it should be there and stay there. Maybe um, people say it's, it's currently uh, being challenged. I think that's, you know, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Um, and here, I mean, I would like to conclude this point um, with uh, uh, an observation regarding something like what we even call a historical form of uh, amnesia. Uh, regarding uh, what are the sources that we can uh, you know, mobilize in order to rethink what democracy might look like in a post-sovereign world. Um, in my view, if there is a tradition that has historically been dealing with uh, what is democracy outside of uh, the sovereign state, this is anarchism. Uh, um, anarchist tradition, uh, they have been dealing with uh, uh, the end of sovereignty, talking about what the world would look like without sovereignty for a long time. And for me what is interesting is that there's a whole bunch of interesting political scientists nowadays, from David Held to, uh, I don't know, we can mention uh, um, a lot of them, writing about uh, the end of sovereignty, uh, the anarchical society, whereby anarchical they just mean the fact that the sovereign state is, is being challenged, uh, or titles such as the global covenant, these are all titles that could have been uh, you know, written by uh, Bakunin or uh, to some of them, or Proudhon, right? Federalism being uh, one of uh, uh, the um, crucial concepts upon which, you know, for a few centuries people have been thinking about, right? And you see now this proliferation of words doing exact, actually exactly the same thing, but without ever mentioning them. And I, I, I recently happened to bump into a paper called Is David Held an Anarchist? Mm -hmm. And then the result is, I think he is, but he didn't realize, right? So there is there is something like a, an historical amnesia on, on this tradition, which I mean, I don't think that that's going to be the solution of all the problems, but maybe it's, it's a tradition that it would be worth exploring uh, along with uh, you know, all the um, other sources that have been uh, brought up in this conference. Uh, let me conclude with, with a quotation. Today, the immense development in production the growth of those requirements which can only be satisfied by the participation of a large number of people in all countries, the means of communication with the travel becoming a commonplace, science, literature, business, and even worse, have all drawn mankind into an even tighter single body with constituent parts united among themselves can only find fulfillment and freedom to develop through the well-being of the other constituent parts as well as of the whole. This is a quotation, could be by David Held, could be by another um, of the many uh, contemporary political scientists dealing with uh, the crisis of nation-state. It was actually written by Maltesta. So maybe there's something there, maybe it's worth exploring, even in this conference. Uh, in conclusion, um, I just want to say, um, let's avoid the temptation of representation, let's avoid the temptation of uh, just a logoroic model of democracy, as well as the temptation of the sovereign state. This is what I think uh, radical democracy is not about. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, the reason why, what is it? What is radical democracy about? Why do we use this term? We mainly use it because we need it to distinguish from uh, uh, what people call democracy nowadays. Uh, but the, um, Rosa Luxemburg once said that calling things with their proper name is the first revolutionary act. Let's call the so-called democracy with their names, like their oligarchies, uh, maybe um, some form of consultative uh, aristocracies, but actually I see very little aristocracies in the sense of you know, the rule of the best going on. Uh, maybe there are principates, like you know, the Berlusconi uh, regime. Um, radical democracy actually is a pleonasm. I mean, democracy is radical, and if it is not radical, it's not democracy. Thank you. <laughs>
whether democracy is or not. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I can be able to do this. Uh, but let, let's say that my first position is that uh, um, uh, let, I'm interested in, in the radical part, probably, of the, <laughs> of the radical uh, democracy cover. And, uh, and I say this because I really think that, uh, uh, and in a sense, this goes also in the, in the direction of some of the things that Tara just said. Uh, I, I really think that the democracy, uh, radical democracy, has to do and should have to do with conflict, uh, which is something which is different from agonism or uh, just antagonism. Um, so, if this is the case, then I would like to uh, try to speak about the challenges for radical democracy or like for trying to understand what radi radical uh, democracy could look like, which are uh, raised by uh, actual events. So, uh, let's say, especially the, the new movements and uh, what we are we're also somehow talking about in, in the time of the chair, uh, I chair today. Um, because I think that uh, by looking at these experiences, we can see uh, some uh, elements of potentiality, but also some elements uh, which are actually problematic and which could go in the direction of uh, somehow uh, remaining uh, prisoners of a, um, of a conception of democracy which uh, leads to some form of uh, empty procedural uh, formalism uh, of democracy, thinking that this will uh, uh, somehow solve the issue. Um, so in fact, I'd like to focus in particular on the, on the movements uh, of the Indian Nazos and especially OWS in, uh, in the States, because I think that the Arab Revolution somehow, although they present elements which are more, uh, uh, for example, the use of a, a certain use of technologies, uh, uh, social networks, uh, and so on, which, are, uh, which speak of, the, of contemporarily, uh, at the same time, they, uh, they also, um, because of the context in which they took place, uh, I think they also present some elements of, of a stronger continuity with the, uh, with the former form of uh, uh, workers' movement or social movements, more uh, generally speaking. Uh, to, to, to give an example, one of the, uh, the, the, the biggest outcome of, uh, of the Egyptian revolution is the creation of a new radical uh, union. And, uh, or in Tunisia, for example, uh, the, um, the organizations, uh, institutional, also institutionalized organizations of the working class actually played a crucial role in the, in the revolutionary process. So we, we have a combination, let's say, of uh, new elements and, uh, and elements coming, uh, belonging more to the tradition of the, of the workers' movement. Uh, the moment of the Indignados and OWS, uh, in my view, uh, somehow uh, speak more of the, um, of the new forms of uh, subjectivation and uh, radicalization uh, today, uh, and in a sense uh, uh, are a response to, to a, a context uh, which uh, uh, is probably characterized by uh, prob the, virtual, the, cri the deep crisis and uh, probably virtual disappearance of the old uh, traditional workers' movement. Uh, in Europe, this is absolutely evident uh, because the, the, the model, uh, let's say, dominated by the, the, the correspondence between working class uh, uh, union social democracy as uh, the political representation of the working class, and then, of course, the, the revolutionary tendencies uh, within this uh, workers' movement, which already existed uh, structurally in this way, uh, doesn't exist anymore. Social democracy is over. Uh, in as social democracy in the sense that the social democratic parties uh, consistently transform themselves into liberal parties uh, and there is a vertical crisis of, uh, uh, of unionism. So this, this, uh, this all uh, schema doesn't exist anymore, let's say it's uh, maybe a little too strong, but I think it, it is over. Um, and uh, uh, and on, the one, on the other hand, we have also a process of uh, um, uh, what we discussed today and the panel discussing about the state of emergency, even if we don't want to call it in this way, but of course we have, uh, uh, in, in the last decades, uh, what we have seen is uh, an increasing uh, uh, resort to uh, either emer emergency laws or actually just the use of uh, um, executive uh, de uh, decisions, like made directly by governments without any, not even any uh, parliamentary discussion, uh, or the, the, the in, especially, this is, a, this is absolutely clear in the European Union in the way in which it, it is dealing with the, with the crisis. So there is a, the continuous reference to, uh, to the emergency of the, uh, created by the crisis and the necessity of uh, uh, just enforcing austerity policy without any form of uh, uh, consultation, not even uh, that which is uh, forcing by formal representative parliamentary uh, democracy. So in, 
In a sense, I think that the movement of uh, indignados and OWS uh, here in the States respond to uh, this uh, uh, increasing uh, uh, impermeability, do you say in English? Impermeability to every kind of uh, uh, instance or uh, pressure coming from uh, outside uh, political institutions. Um, and of course, in, 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 in this sense, I think that uh, they played, and, and this, I think, it, it is a, a, a extremely positive role. They played the, somehow the role that uh, um, they embodies what the Rancière would call the scandal of democracy, which means uh, it, it is uh, um, they, the, the, the role they played in a consistent way was, was uh, that of challenging not only institutions, like political institutions or political representative institutions, uh, creating a, a, an alternative uh, side of democracy and democratic empowerment, uh, but also to challenge uh, uh, pre-existing pre organizations, uh, and especially the organizations of, uh, of the old workers' movement. So, it, in, in this sense, uh, they, uh, these movements, uh, um, not forcibly because of their political positions, but uh, for the very way in which they work, and, they, and for this uh, extreme uh, strong demand of democracy from below. Uh, because then you also have uh, um, you have lots of oppositions within this movement, so that the point is not what kind of position, political position with regard to, for example, reformist politics uh, these movements uh, took. The point is that what they did, what, what was the actual practice of, the, of this movement. And the actual practice of these movements, I think, was a practice of, practice of uh, uh, continuous uh, um, questioning and disruption of uh, uh, the idea of a monopoly of the, of the mobilization uh, by uh, pre-existing uh, uh, highly institutionalized and uh, vertical organization. I think this uh, says uh, something very important uh, about the new forms of politicization today, the new form of subjectivation. I think that uh, uh, if uh, we think uh, radical democracy within the context of uh, building again a new, uh, new social movements uh, uh, and something which could replace the, the old workers' movement, uh, I think that this element of uh, um, deep challenging of uh, uh, vertical conception of organization which somehow characterized the, 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 the old workers' movement. I think this is a, a crucial point to, uh, to take into account, and I think a positive point. Um, at the same time, I think that there are also some problems, and I will refer here especially to the uh, OWS case, because it is the one I know better, um, not, not as a scholar, but more as an activist, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I will uh, uh, list, I will underline two uh, basic uh, limits of the consensus model, which uh, has been applied within the OWS, and the, and the uh, conception of democracy, which is behind this uh, this model. Um, and uh, I, since I have very few, like not so much time, I will be very trivial. In the sense, of course, consensus model is not the same in all, uh, and all experiences are also different from each other in different cities. The Oakland experience is not the same as the New York experience, and most of what I'm saying is, is based especially on, on the on, on, on OWS in New York, on the New York case, which somehow presents this limit in, a, uh, in the clearest way, let's say. The, the two limits I say, I, I, I would uh, uh, underline are, are one, Hanidan what I would call a hidden methodological individualism, which is at the basis of, uh, of the consensus model. And, uh, and the second is uh, the absence of, uh, uh, of the time question, uh, which in my view, and I will look at Aristotle for this, uh, in my view, uh, it, it is actually a crucial question if we discuss about democracy and participatory and democracy in all these different forms. Why did the methodological individualism? Uh, this has to do with the, the impression I have is that in the model of consensus, and uh, one can also see this, for example, in the uh, ex, uh, um, extenuating discussion within the movement about the procedures, and about, uh, uh, for example, when uh, the, there was a decision to make about the election or not of a Fox Council, like the extenuating, extenuating discussion about the about this, whether having or not uh, um, a Fox Council. Um, 
My impression is that the idea behind this is that, is that the democracy somehow is, uh, and, and therefore also wants a consensus, is somehow the result of uh, uh, some form of arithmetic addition of uh, individual sensibilities. And that uh, the reason why, for example, uh, people were actually resisting to the idea of a Fox Council was somehow the idea that, the, you know, individual sensibilities cannot be represented. This is true, of course, they cannot be represented individual sensibilities. Uh, and, and, and therefore, every form of representation, even uh, the, the basic form you know, of uh, having uh, spokes, uh, spoke people uh, uh, controlled by from below and so on, was already problematic <coughs> because it was already somehow a replacement of the direct participation and expression of my individual uh, sensibilities in, uh, sensibility in all uh, its nuances uh, uh, through uh, uh, some form of representative. Uh, I find this problematic for. Uh, um, for the basic reason that, uh, and, and this is something that Nadia uh, mentioned today uh, by speaking about tumults, uh, because I strongly believe in uh, uh, the process of subjectivation uh, and therefore also creation of uh, identities uh, uh, through conflict. Uh, so in other words, I strongly believe uh, in processes of, uh, and I think that the radical democracy should have to do with this, uh, with processes of uh, collective subjectivation uh, through conflict and participation, in which uh, uh, um, the, 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 the main issue is not my pre-existent individuality, <coughs> the main issue is, uh, is where we are going and what we are uh, actually uh, trying to be, like what the process of transform collective transformation. Um, and I, I, the, the impression I had is that uh, in the bit, somehow bits and time, if you read the minutes of the general assemblies, you will see that uh, I'm not in such a but that somehow bits and time discussion about procedures, which uh, um, together with the discussion of finances, uh, how to spend the money, uh, took most of the time of uh, many general assemblies uh, in New York, um, was uh, based in, in this in, uh, in an idea of, of, of democracy as a uh, as procedure as a some. So if you find that like the, 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 the procedural, the perfect procedural schema, then you will uh, probably have uh, a process, process uh, a real democratic process. So the, the, the problem is a matter of rules. I'm not denying the fact that rules are important in the sense of what kind of uh, uh, rules you, you, you decide collectively in order to decide. But somehow, somehow uh, the, the movement that reproduce or risk reproducing uh, the, uh, a conception of uh, democracy as first uh, based on uh, uh, individual, uh, uh, the individual particularities uh, and particular interests, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, of democracy as uh, empty, emptiness of procedure, procedural uh, schema, which characterizes actually uh, uh, late capitalist uh, uh, liberal democracies. So somehow we didn't manage to break this cage, uh, but the model was uh, the theoretical. Uh, uh, position behind uh, this model was uh, uh, risk, uh, risk to be the, the same. I don't know if this is clear. The second problem, and I will uh, shut up, <laughs> is the question of time, which is related to also to what I was saying. Uh, because uh, time is, 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 uh, is, uh, is basically a crucial factor if we want to speak about democracy. And this was very clear to Aristotle, which in, in the politics, in the first book uh, of the politics, uh, defines uh, the slaves as uh, uh, tools or instruments for action, not for production. This is a very interesting point. Why for action? Because uh, what is the role of slaves? To do the work at, uh, at the place of the free citizens so that they can be free of uh, act, so performing what is specifically a human, rational human rights. <coughs> so going to the, uh, to the assemblies and uh, uh, very demanding uh, uh, assemblies and procedures of a direct democracy. Uh, so this was very clear uh, uh, to the Greeks for, uh, from, uh, from, the, from the very beginning. Now, why I'm saying this? Um, because uh, what I, see, I saw in the movement was uh, somehow a lack of consideration for the, for the element of time. And how the, the way in which you manage time uh, can create exclusion or, exclusion or inclusion. Mm -hmm. Not addressing this point means that uh, what you are risking to do is that in order to create the most uh, formally perfect uh, democratic model, you are actually reproducing exactly the exclusion on the same line of class, race, and gender, which uh, exclude already people in, uh, in reality. Why? Well, for the very basic fact, people need to reproduce themselves. Uh, and of course, what happened in the moment is at the moment, uh, uh, the movement did 
take care of the material reduction of uh, some people, the people who were uh, staying there. But this model was not generated, it couldn't become a general model uh, that uh, uh, one could apply to everyone. So of course, the people who stay in the park could spend all their, all, all their time doing this because the occupation itself was uh, taking care for, of the material reduction of, of uh, they didn't, okay, they were sleeping there, but so they, they, they did have food and so on and so on. And this also created the, 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 the problem of the discussion of finance, but okay, this is another issue. Uh, the problem is that a, a movement can do this only when, uh, let's say, the um, normal temporality of society is uh, entirely disrupted. So revolutionary movement, moments. Times Square also uh, provided materially for, uh, uh, or tried to provide materially for the, for, for the material reduction of people in, in the square. But we are speaking about you know, the, 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 the real disruption of the entire <laughs> temporality of, of, of the society in which uh, somehow the ordinary time was suspended. This is not the normal uh, situation of, uh, in which uh, movements operate. So that, uh, the, the, risk of, uh, the risk is that, that you create some form of uh, suspended tempor temporality of the, of, the, of the participants of the movement in, in self, which uh, has nothing to do with the temporality of the, uh, of, uh, of the, of the life of people outside the movement. So that those who are ex excluded from this process are exactly those who have more the need of reproducing themselves. And, and this is uh, uh, particularly the case for uh, uh, racialized people or for women. Who, in addition of uh, uh, the problem of reproducing like, of the work, they also have an additional work, which is the, uh, the reproductive work. Um, so I think that uh, not addressing this issue uh, somehow risk to to lead to a separation between uh, the the activist of, of the movement as a, some form of separate body from the social from the very social sectors uh, which. Uh, the movement somehow, for, for which this movement somehow should, should fight. Mm -hmm. um, so I will just shut here because I think I spoke too much, but I would say that these two elements, so subjectivation through conflict uh, and time, I think should be uh, among the key issues that we address if we want to speak, to speak of a real or a radical democracy. to him, um, I told uh, Chiara and Cynthia that they need to prepare, I didn't tell him to prepare, so he, and he, didn't he can talk, about, topic was, uh, he can talk about, about anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll respond maybe to what you both have said. Um, so it seemed like you were saying to, uh, Chiara, no. Cynthia was saying I think she was talking about strategies of radicalization or a kind of revolutionary politics for that kind of thing. Well, Gara seemed more interested in um, the image of the common or the image of the practices of the society that would sustain what we would call radical democracy, of the, of the of maybe it's the image of what the communist society would look like after the revolution. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this is a false uh, dichotomy. Anyway, so the institutions <laughs> through which, what I got what you're saying is about these different institutions that what makes us democratic. But I, I don't quite get the. Um, so what? So my question is just to say, well, why why not representation? Why, um, isn't representation part of what? Just what politics is? Why associate it with elections? Why not associate it with sortition? As um, we heard yesterday, for instance, isn't a question like how we represent ourselves? The question is a democratic question. We can't not have representation, because we won't have this kind of, um, and similarly with speech, why not speech? Why associate speech with consensus, deliberation, a, a certain kind of deliberative model? Of, and then even then, what, why not, why isn't, why isn't that part of what we would count as uh, democracy together with power? Uh, power, I wasn't quite clear what, when you said power is this about deciding, and is it decision something that happens through speech? If we're going to decide what's just and what's unjust, we need speech to make these decisions. You know, so what, what, why isn't speech part of power? Um, and same with sovereignty. Why, why not sovereignty? 
with sovereignty. <laughs> <laughs> sovereignty is exclusive, but we want to exclude some stuff. Right? In a radical democracy, we want everything. Uh, we want to make right, you know, decisions to the, what we won't tolerate in a radical democracy. So again, it's really the anarchist movement and the experience of anarchism is part of the enacting our freedom or actualizing our freedom through but, but what is why associate sovereignty with the territorial state and it's the actual existing state here. Um, but I did agree that we have one point about it. But it's not you know, it's uh, it's not democracy if it's not radical, I So and um, and I guess uh, for me, the, the, maybe some of the, the reason why I'm, I'm the devil's advocate here, I suppose, is because there was, I think throughout the conference, there has been circulating these kind of oppositions that we set up. In fact, I've just been using them in my own uh, presentation to sort of set up this sort of strong distinction. Um, but I think they're also potentially something that's easily attracted and fall into in, in talking about radical democracy in, in the way that we think these uh, oppositions. Because, uh, uh, sure, speech, as I said, the way I put it is, maybe it's a, it's a necessary condition for democracy, but it's not a sufficient condition. And I say so because I see that a lot of uh, very creative and interesting work is devoted to speech, right? And, uh, and I think that's, that's just, it's misleading, because it's just one part. Uh, maybe an important part, maybe not so important, I mean, I leave it up to you, but we should be clear, <coughs> we are not going to get to democracy, which has to do with power, uh, just, you know, uh, from speech. Representation is a little bit more tricky. Uh, sure, there can be representation, uh, but the important point here is that, uh, at least since uh, uh, modern times, so since the invention of sovereignty, and then I move on to sovereignty, representation um, has, been, has become uh, associated with sovereignty and therefore with the idea of a, a delegation of power which is uh, um, not uh, temporary and not, uh, no longer negotiable once it has taken place. And Hobbes, in, uh, Hobbes invented both sovereignty and uh, representation and he did so <laughs> And he did so together in order to explain how sovereignty is possible, in order to explain how it is possible that there is in a territory somebody who is sovereign, which literally means superior and non recognitions and Hans Kelsen uh, would say sovereignty, sovereign is only God. No, Ob says sovereign is the Leviathan. Why? Because the <coughs> Leviathan can represent other people. Now, what does it mean to represent other people? It means that um, Hobbes um, goes back to a metaphor of the theater. He says to represent means to bear to bear the person of the people you are representing. Yeah? And indeed, the image of the Leviathan is that huge body uh, made by single bodies, yeah? <laughs> physically bearing the person of the other people. Uh, Hobbes, who was a nominalist, he knew very well this was a fiction, right? Uh, there cannot be representation in this sense. Um, and, and indeed, he says, what is representation? It goes back to uh, theater, uh, to represent, it means to wear a mask. Uh, so, sovereignty for Hobbes was clear, it's a fiction um, that it's only possible because of representation, which is not temporary, it's not delegation, but it's representation. Once uh, uh, you have the institution of uh, representation combined with sovereignty, you have the paradox of one who is sovereign 
at the expenses of all the others. And I know mean, this is this is very clear. That's in my view where all, all the, uh, the problems begins. Also because the argument is uh, um, you need sovereignty in order to guarantee the security of the people. And then, uh, as we know very well, the paradox is that the sovereign, being outside of um, the legal system, has uh, uh, the right to kill you with impunity. And so this wonderful passage where uh, Hobbes says you have the right to resist. Uh, the sovereign, if the sovereign is commanding you to, uh, you know, kill yourself, you can resist, but the sovereign can nevertheless kill you. So you are not outside of it. Um, so it's not just the, um, what is the, the problem here? Representation is not per se the problem. You can also have representation, but that's not representation. That's delegate. And if you have people representing you for a limited amount of time. That's not uh, representation, or if you want to call it that, it becomes just a question of name. If you want to call it representation, that it's representation, but without sovereignty. Uh, in the sense that what is problematic is the combination of the two. Now, why not sovereignty? And uh, I hope, in a way, what I've said uh, uh, until now responds to this. Uh, what, why not sovereignty? Because, uh, um, First of all, uh, sovereignty, historically speaking, went together with uh, the birth of the state. Uh, uh, with the idea that within a given territory, you can say there is somebody who is sovereign, which literally means superior non recognition, uh, who does not recognize a person superior, anybody superior. Uh, the frontispiece of the Leviathan with the quotation. Uh, no, there's nothing superior uh, to, the, to uh, the Leviathan on Earth. Uh, what does it mean? It means that within a, a, a state, within a, a clear cut boundaries, there is somebody who is superior and therefore has the right to exclude all those who are not there. I mean, why not? Why not? First of all, because it produces uh, uh, the exclusion of all of those who are um, outside of it. Uh, or maybe all those, because then this goes together with the notion of citizenship, all those who are, uh, who happen, maybe because they're illegal immigrants, who happen to be inside the sovereign state uh, without being part of the sovereign state. Uh, sovereignty goes together with citizenship. But the second reason is that, I mean, why do we want to go with sovereignty now that it's being questioned? Uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's also precisely at the moment when, uh, uh, historically speaking, the idea of sovereignty, the idea that you can be, take a single territory and uh, find uh, somebody inside of this territory who, is, uh, uh, who does not recognize any superior, is being questioned, both below and um, above the nation state. Uh, so, I, actually, I don't see why that's such a good idea. <laughs> uh, just quickly, in one sense, I think all the things, all the problems, all the concepts you're using name problems. Or political theory of how to think about politics, and there are also many problems that are empirical problems that came up precisely in your discussion of revolutionary politics, the problem of representation, the problem of authority, that's called it instead of sovereignty. I mean, why, why tie sovereignty to Hobbes? I mean, uh, so the problem of authority, the problem of representation, the problem of speech are all problems of politics that we can't, and we need concepts to make sense. So, I'm still, I, I, I still disagree. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll open it, I'll collect some questions, maybe five at a time, and so starting here. I think I'll continue with this discussion, a uh, question for Kara. Um, I think there's a problem with the way to be form if we formulate it as these are necessary but not sufficient conditions. I think we are really not understanding the relationship of these terms, representation, speech, and um, sovereignty to uh, democracy. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it really leaves it weak. In what sense they are necessary but not sufficient. So, um, I, since I can't do all of that, all of these terms, it would take such a long time, I'll just start with the centrality of speech. I can basically reverse your argument, which was, you know, radical democracy is not representation, it's not speech, it's not sovereignty, right? I can reverse that and basically say, radical democracy is nothing if it's not representation, if it's not speech, if it's not sovereignty. And I can use, um, to support that argument, not only several radical democratic practices throughout history, but also several radical democratic theories, you know, 
from Cornelis uh, Castoriadis to Etienne Fagebar to Jacques Rancière, all the people that we usually invoke in a group. I would like to say so, with Castoriadis. <laughs> 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 I would like to say with really? Luis Castoriadis because my first point was almost uh, an entire quotation. Uh, well, how can you have, you know, Castoria this without uh, speech, right? Uh, so, uh, how can you have the radical democracy of Castoria this without something like speech? And I'm just going to focus on speech. Democracy and speech are intrinsically related, and in that sense, radical if democracy is not, you know, nothing without radical democracy, then these two are intrinsically related. Uh, when uh, you know we're talking about the etymological uh, origin of the word democracy, said it's demos and kratos, it's the power of demos, the world of demos. Yes, but what are they doing? What was it about? What was that democratic rule about? It was about isonomia, which was equal right to politics. That was understood as isegoria, which was equal right to speech. And speech was essential for the equalization of all these citizens. So how are we going to talk about equal equality? You know, uh, democratic equality. If we com if we eliminate speech, it is essential for not only for uh, these uh, radical democratic pacts, but also for people like Bolivar, for people like Castro. Yeah. Okay, I have, I have, a, I have <laughs> a very long list of, of people who want to engage. So Antoine, Scott, Victoria. And then we'll continue after so, that. So, I, will, I, will I have all of you on the list, so I will disagree on Castoriadis because he, he distinguishes ecclesia to and agora. And free speech it's agora. But you have you, you can discuss and discuss and discuss, but you have to decide at one time. And that's I think your point. So you have to decide in the ecclesia. And when you only talk about free speech, you have no no uh, right to decision. And, and uh, my question was I agree with everything Kiara said. We have both read too much Castoriadis. Except one thing about anarchism. And there I am Castoriadis. Because with anarchism. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with, with anarchism, as Proudhon said, it's order without power. So without Kratos, without the Kratos of the democracy. Whereas, in my opinion, democracy is power, but popular power, one specific, specific kind of power, with disorder. That's not an anarchy, it's not an idea. So what do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> now I have Scott, Victoria, and Andreas in the back. Well, since we're continuing, people, that's why we can't stop reading anarchism with Proudhon, right? Because yes. there's yeah, Kropotkin right. coming afterwards, who shows you the order without power. But uh, the question that I have um, sort of is to attempt to build off a little bit of both what Shinzia and Kiara said, which is that it, it seems in many ways that the, the issues that both of you bring up and something that I've been thinking about throughout these past two days is that the solution for democracy is not always democracy, right? And so the, the question that I have then is in describing the to a certain extent, the post-revolutionary radical democracy is, as Chiara sort of in challenged us to think about and to describe the revolutionary moment of the creation of democracy as Chinzi challenged us to think about. Democracy is not necessarily the revolutionary moment, right? Because and the, the issue that I want to put forward is the idea that radical democracy can necessarily solve the revolutionary social question, not in the sense that Arendt means it, in the sense that Marx or Bakunin means it, right? And to me, that that doesn't happen. Real radical democracy is only capable, is only possible after this. Whether you call it communism or anarchism or whatever you want to call it. And so the, this this is the question I have: is that because of the difficulties of radical democracy in a revolutionary movement, because of the difficulties of radical democracy simply growing out of bourgeois democracy or liberal democracy, because of the problems of state and sovereignty and communication and so is is radical democracy something that we're describing because we no longer want to describe a, is it is it a new way to consider a post-revolutionary society or is it a way to get around having to consider that at all that's my question Yeah. 
is a necessary but not sufficient condition uh, for, uh, for democracy. I can also think of democracy without representation, at least without representation uh, how it came to uh, be conceptualized uh, in modernity, which is permanent representation. That's the difference. Uh, um, and, uh, and I can also think uh, of uh, uh, democracy without sovereignty. It might be there, but it might also be there, and maybe it's a good thing if it is not there. Um, free speech, I don't, I don't think that you can have a democracy without a free speech, but I, as Chisa has nice put it, in my, it was an attempt to invite not to just focus on free speech. Okay, I have a long list. Victoria, Victoria first, Andreas, Mikulas, Sonia, Matt, and Chris. So, <laughs> Speech. It just it just struck me. I, I thought, um, well, there are there are communities all over the world that are biologically limited. They do not have speech, right? Um, are they precluded then from democratic practices? It's just a technical mention. So perhaps um, because we were talking about naming and the importance of naming, so perhaps we could speak of the importance of those kind of to discuss language. Maybe language is better, and also maybe communication. I don't know because speech, by naming certain practices as speech, I think we also limit somehow the spectrum of what is possible for mm -hmm. radical um, action. Uh, but also, I really liked the um, um, I really liked um, in the last paper. It's, um, there was some attempt to think about playfulness. Um, Sorry, uh, you were uh, mentioning um, this kind of mimetic, um, um, I don't know, a, an attempt to create something new that ends up just reproducing what already exists. So this mimetic aspect of some radical uh, um, action or movements. Um, and it made me think about those uh, Marina's uh, paper, <coughs> and this idea of you know, how uh, um, how people without papers would just act and enact in order to playfully uh, make their way into a system that is excluding them. And also Andrew's um, uh, thing about uh, this um, the Aboriginal um, um, embassy basically mimicking um, the, the system in order to mock it. So I sometimes wonder whether there can't be perhaps in this imitation also something radical. So as long as it is a conscious and a, as long as you are aware that you are imitating and you're conscious, do, you're doing it consciously and I don't know, perhaps mocking it as well, um, perhaps something new then uh, can, can come out of it. So perhaps that there is some radical potential. And also the issue of time, I think that is so important. I don't think we've discussed it because perhaps there needs to be a, a whole conference just on yes. graphical democracy and time. It's just such a really great concept. Thank you very much for interesting. I would like to come back to the problem of the representation. I was surprised that you talked about representation only in, in, uh, in terms of parliament and delegation, because I, I think uh, in uh, the, um, Classical uh, theories of radical democracy, as in Lefort and Laclau, La um, representation has also uh, another meaning. Uh, uh, um, the meaning that there is no adequate representation of the society. No, no one can, can claim to, to, to give a, 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 a picture or a representation of the society, but this doesn't mean that there are no representations. Of course, there are many conflicting representations, and, and uh, so representation is still uh, uh, very important for these uh, authors. And um, uh, so, so I, I wouldn't um, um, construct your three points in, in, in another way. Um, I wouldn't start with a, with a, um, a no, but with a um, neither nor. I, I think um, all these uh, authors know that. that um, 
Now, representation is not enough, that maybe also speech is not, not enough, but we cannot skip this. Uh, we, we need forms of mediation, we need uh, symbolic media uh, to, 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 um, to um, uh, give a, uh, 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 to, to provide a stage for our conflicts. Uh, so so, so uh, and I wouldn't say that, that um, radical democracy um, means um, uh, uh, only direct and and um, uh, uh, yeah, direct democracy, only a action versus speech, and, and, and so on. We always uh, need both sides, and, and it's a, a kind of uh, ongoing conflict between both sides. And, and this is also uh, would be too easy just to say no. And if you if you uh, do this, you I think you end up in, in this Zizek and and Badiou corner, and you only have events and and and, and uh, revolutionary acts and so on. And, but this is not a theory of democracy, and, and so, so I think you have to, to decide uh, anarchism or <laughs> um, uh, radical democracy. And if it's only anarchism, uh, then it's no longer democracy. <laughs> <laughs> in defense of speech also. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, just, uh, I just wanted to uh, point out maybe we should uh, introduce uh, differentiation, slight differentiation because between speech and talk, because you yourself mentioned, you said like, we just talk and talk and talk. But these are two different things, speech and talk, and speech is uh, representation, it's a self-representation, speech is declarative, and uh, what's the third one for speech? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I forgot. But as I said, as I, want to put it, I, I really like it. It's, you know, it's the difference between ecclesia and agora. Speaking and talking, making decisions, declaring them, and talking. So maybe we have to speak more and talk less. <laughs> and the other thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Can Boyd now teach us a <laughs> and my second small point, maybe we also should understand speech as, you know, the oral act, because we can, oh, you know, occupy walls, they invented a whole new language, it's also speech, although, you know, not necessarily anything comes out, but, so there are different forms of speech, you know, braille, you know, it's also, you know, people read, write, you can say speech, but, you know, there's no sound, so. So my point is not about speech. <laughs> um, actually, I wanted to address uh, the two limitations of the consensus model that uh, you elaborated on, especially with regard to the OWS. Um, so first about the, um, this kind of hidden methodological individualism somehow giving away to the fixation on, on procedure. And you gave the example of you know all of the discussions in the General Assembly being about the finances. I, you know, because I've been thinking about this as well, and I'm not so sure that's attributable entirely, um, you know, to a fixation on procedures. Because actually, to go back to the idea that right, it's precisely in, in you know for the cause of challenging the existing vertical model of you know um, political decision making that there I felt like there was. You know, a, a point to say, you know, we're not just going to allow, like, you know, one, you know, I mean, and I know, we all know that there are working groups, right? But the idea was that at least as far as the running of, you know, this movement um, is, is concerned, that we're going to stick to the General Assembly to make these decisions. And, you know, so the movement as a whole encountered a lot of difficulties as a result, but I really feel like that kind of a spirit of self-determination was at least initially behind, right, the decision to do this. And secondly, um, about Time. I think that it's precisely what, what you said, that the specificity of OWS and the Indianapolis comes from the decline of not just workers' identity, right? Um, that it's, you know, kind of come into this, you know, fully square, you know, where people could out precisely because organization in the workplace has been rendered, um, Challenging, I know there are unions and such, but and you know there are people, I mean, who have legitimate grievances, right? Whose concerns cannot be addressed through those models, and that's why that they're gathering where they're gathering. And of course, um, like you know, there have been kind of like you know sub occupy movements, like you know occupy sunset park, occupy Harlem, um, you know, to bring it into the communities. But apart from those, then how do you see 
um, how do you think it would be possible to address the issue of time, you know, in the sense of bringing it to the people who really need to participate in that? <coughs> So Republicans, liberals, Laurentians, <coughs> Marxists, um, and anarchists all have quite concise and defined concepts of freedom. Um, and they're both theoretically very useful, and they're also practically very useful. But none of us, I don't think today um, or yesterday, have tried to identify a radical democratic concept of freedom. Um, and I don't know if this is just because maybe it's not on the agenda, but then that is another question. Why isn't it on the agenda? And if it could be on the agenda. And last but not least, Chris. So um, I wanted to sort of go back to part of what um, Carol was talking about with anarchism and sort of defend it, but sort of indirectly. Um, because I think if you look right now, we can look at federalist movements, we can look at bioregional movements, we can look at the Encuentros and the Caracoles, the Zapatistas, we can look at sort of North American and other indigenous political models that are doing precisely what we're sort of talking about we wish could happen, but are already sort of in practice. They're not sort of stuck in this theoretical um, sort of idea. And so I wonder if part, and this goes back to what I was asking Andrew earlier, if part of the problem itself is that it will be impossible to think about radical democracy within a Western philosophical framework. Mm -hmm. And if so, are we wasting our time tracing this whole Greek democratic idea in order to rethink a radical democratic idea? And if that's the case, how and what do we need to go about thinking as far as a model for politics because if we want a non-sovereign, non-representational, non-authoritarian politics, those did exist historically. I mean, we can't say that indigenous politics didn't have some you know, vertical hierarchy. They absolutely did, shamans or you know, chieftains or priestesses, whatever it was. But as far as a model that's far better in a sense of what we're looking at, those models have existed and do still exist. The problem is, are they reconcilable with a Western or even uh, sort of modern, not even just the Western. I don't know if China or Indonesia could implement an indigenous, non-hierarchical politics today, even within their own sort of traditions. So I guess my question is, are we limiting ourselves by thinking about radical democracy within a Western sort of philosophical, um, juridical framework? Um, yes, yeah, so actually, uh, I, I, I'd like to begin with this last question. I mean, it's a great question. Uh, I don't have a, a full answer to this. Uh, you make me think. Um, but I would like to see that uh, something that was a, a bit implicit in what I said. I do believe that there is a, a heavy burden that we are bringing with us uh, from the Western uh, tradition in political thinking, uh, which uh, uh, we have a hard time getting rid of, right? Uh, and uh, uh, the reason for this is that, um, first of all, there is the presumption uh, um, of uh, uh, I, was, I would call the Eurocentric trap, uh, where we think that, okay, democracy, we invented democracy. It was the Greeks, right? Uh, how about the rest of the world? You know, they were living in Oriental despotism. They were living, uh, uh, you know, in the world of myth. We had the logos and uh, uh, democracy. Uh, the Greeks invented them. The Europeans, uh, uh, this is the cradle of civilization uh, and the rest. Um, what do we do with the East? You know, historically speaking, and we, we end up with the rest of the world with colonialism, empires, um, and that kind of stuff. Now, the, the point is. We should really start with thinking, first of all, the genealogy. I mean, have, have the Greeks really invented democracy? There are archaeological studies showing that even those people that the Greeks deem barbarous living under a uh, you know, despotic government actually had forms of democracy, uh, even uh, you know, direct radical democracy. Not many examples, but there are examples. And, Oh, oh, most of the time, we know, apart from a few archaeological studies, we know nothing about it. Uh, 
So we don't have the linguistic capacity, first of all, to read uh, that kind of sources. So I think there's a whole world there to be discovered. And uh, um, I think also getting out of this uh, presumptuous attitude that we invented democracy, so we know how to get it work uh, in, in the current condition, uh, would be particularly uh, welcome. So you know, thank you for, uh, for your question. Uh, on the question of freedom, um, I, I try to be very brief, um, not to fall prey of the logoria uh, I was uh, um, actually mentioning before. Uh, the quotation from uh, uh, Malatesta, I take it from a paper uh, entitled The Freedom of Equals uh, that you know, I gave last year at the new school. So I, I do believe that freedom is on the agenda um, and we could have actually uh, framed a lot of the discussion that went on uh, in the last two days uh, under uh, the concept of you know, freedom, uh, uh, freedom versus autonomy, or freedom as autonomy, or autonomy as freedom. If this kind of, you know, right, it just seems indefinite, very yeah. Like, what is the freedom of equals? So the equals are together, but what are they? Are they free from arbitrary power, or are they free from interference, or are they free to do politics, or are they not alienated from the like, You know, it, it just seems like freedom is so normative and powerful. And that um, to identify a radical democratic variant um, could be a hugely powerful thing to do. Um, it just seems indefinite. Well, okay, I mean, it, it, that's a, it opens a whole uh, uh, discussion. I'm not going to give you uh, the whole paper here. <laughs> I think that's enough for you. But and I really, I would know how to summarize this in, 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 a, in a few words. Uh, I, I would just want to say that uh, I think freedom uh, as a concept is uh, uh, somehow heavier and broader than uh, the notion of autonomy. Um, but I think it's a burden that we have to uh, take on us if we want to avoid um, the, um, you know, the end result of uh, a self-imposed ghetto, which is uh, the ghetto of autonomy, um, which, I mean, to put it in a, in very bluntly, uh, is, uh, is the end result of uh, just focusing on, on autonomy rather than freedom, and thinking about freedom as uh, giving, just giving the law to oneself, uh, we may end up with uh, uh, freedom as the freedom of uh, the luxury result. You know, like we have a little community which is free, and, uh, uh, and is uh, a free inside of itself. And it has sovereignty, it has democracy, and right. Now, why do I say so? Because I, by freedom of equals, I actually mean a form of freedom uh, whereby you cannot be free unless everybody else is free. Um, and therefore, uh, my attempt has been to re one, at rethinking freedom as something that either we get it uh, globally or nobody's going to get it. And it is not uh, a much of an original project, it's a, a, a way to recover uh, Bakunin understanding of freedom, which, to be blunt, is a form of Hegelian understanding of freedom, uh, but without uh, patriotism and uh, without uh, you know, the dialectic, which I think it's, a, it's an advantage. Um, so, I mean, I hope uh, that I managed to make sense in a few minutes of uh, why I think that freedom uh, is on the agenda. Um, talk, speech, speech is being more than talk. Uh, I mean, if you are willing to say that speech includes in itself the exercise of power and uh, decisions, uh, uh, maybe we can agree that you know, that's it. But in most, uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, my linguistic competencies, uh, uh, when we talk about speech, we don't talk about taking decisions, and I think you cannot have democracy without uh, decisions. And you cannot have democracy without power. But maybe you're not happy if we have other occasions to consider decisions. Um, finally, uh, maybe put it together, uh, uh, Andreas and uh, uh, Victoria, question about representation. Uh, maybe there's a misunderstanding. My first point was to say uh, radical democracy is not representative democracy. And when I said, uh, let us not fall in the temptation of a representation, I meant let us not fall in the, in the 
representation of political representation, by which I mean what is currently going on. Uh, I've written a, a book on myth one, uh, trying to uh, say what myth and symbols are important even for radical politics. Another one on imagination, which is arguing um, why we need representation, even uh, why we need um, um, uh, play and mockery. Uh, so um, I do believe that some form of representation is, is important, also because representation is such a broad concept. And what does it mean? Representation, representation, making present what is absent. I mean, without representation, we would not have human beings. So you would not have. Uh, the subject uh, themselves uh, of democratic processes. Uh, and uh, um, yes, I think I can uh, conclude here. Um, yeah, no, just shortly. The, the first question about the numeric uh, aspect. Um, I, I take what uh, Marina says, uh, said in a, maybe in a different way. Um, the impression I had that, um, uh, is that it, it, it was actually a very interesting. Uh, uh, talk um, and uh, and I, I think it was also related somehow to what Richard was saying about uh, the fact that it is not true that people can be reduced to bad life uh, and I, I absolutely agree with you on this I think that I'm just really wrong uh, and, and, and this is a proof in the sense that uh, uh, somehow you always have forms of uh, resistance to, uh, to, to different uh, forms of power oppression and so on. And these forms are not uh, forcibly uh, uh, conscious, uh, like the, the outcome of a uh, political strategy. But the, the, they are some forms of uh, you know, strategy of resistance. So for example, this uh, display, uh, this, uh, this rule of, uh, I, I will answer uh, yes to every uh, question which started, are you? And, <laughs> and no to every question which started with the you? And so on and so on. We, so they are diff different, uh, also playful, uh, um, strategies of resistance, and I think that they have a relationship, uh, and that they should have uh, a relationship with them with the political forms of resistance. Um, for example, in the, in the in the 60s, this was more or less the attempt by by authors like uh, Pansieri or Tronti like, to to understand to start from uh, class composition, understood all, not only the, as a technical composition, so which sectors and uh, how many. Uh, but also class composition in the sense of what is the way in which the class is continuously resist to exploitation, and there was all this uh, the, this idea of in social inquiry, inquiry as uh, you know and try, trying to understand what are these continuous strategies uh, uh, put in place by by workers in order to re to, to resist exploitation, for example, uh, slowing down, down production, uh, going to the bathroom very often, uh, taking a coffee, skipping a piece uh, in, the, in the chain. So, and of course, there, are, there were forms which were uh, also related to the, the, the form in which work was organized. No? So, uh, strategy within, uh, let's say, if you want to use this word, within a uh, 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 power uh, uh, framework. Uh, it was a, you know, a strategy which could uh, um, fit within this the, the framework. And the, the, the attempts by Trump in particular was to say uh, the, the political forms of organization of the, of the class should start from this point. Like, what are the, the, spontaneous, uh, the, the spontaneous forms of, uh, of, of resistance? No, I'm not sure that uh, uh, my point about you know, the, the reduction of uh, uh, a certain uh, um, uh, hidden <laughs> methodology of individualism, you know, other less has something to do with this. I'm not convinced that uh, this is the case. I think it was a really pass within, uh, within the movement, which produced a lot of problems, by the way, like, which produced a, a certain, in New York, especially in New York, a certain element of uh, lack of efficacy. Or, uh, and, uh, and just a few words with the issue of finances. Uh, I, don't, I, uh, I don't think that this, uh, like this uh, obsession with finances uh, has a single cause. I'm a very uh, like a big fan of uh, multiple causes uh, to explain social phenomena, so just, not just one which can uh, give you the answer. But I think we got, it did have to do, because what, what is the problem? The problem is that uh, the moment in New York didn't manage to put in place uh, a, a body, a decisional body, uh, also three forms of representation if necessary, uh, not parliamentary representation, but other forms, which could uh, uh, somehow uh, um, um, make a step uh, beyond uh, just the, a collection of particularism. 
So that the problem with this, what was, what was the impasse of the discussion about finances? That everybody went to these assemblies by bringing just their particular uh, position and need. Right. So there was the need of the people who were staying in the place and who wanted money for the metro cards. Like the very, because of marginal interest also, you know, they didn't have money and they wanted money for, uh, to, to pay the metro cards. And this was a big discussion and fight in the movement at a certain moment. Uh, there were uh, working, individual working groups asking for money to organize the action, you know, A, B, C, and so So, in, in the problem is that uh, the, the formula of this, the, the way in which the discussion was organized uh, and the formula of the General Assembly didn't really allow to overcome this kind of uh, particularistic uh, interest. And then this has to do with, with my point that uh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in that democracy as just an additional collection of uh, uh, particularism. And, and the point is how you put in place uh, you know, the, uh, what kind of institutions uh, movement is it, you put in place in order to overcome this. And from this point of view, I think that a certain element of representation is necessary. Because I don't, uh, not parliamentary representation, but a certain element of representation, representation which allows to go uh, somehow beyond the, the, just the collection of uh, an uh, arithmetic addition of uh, individual interest, I think, or, uh, or also particular, like group interest. Uh, so somehow, uh, at a certain moment, the movement reproduced the, the, the logic of lobbies. Yeah. And uh, you know, every working group would go to the assembly and uh, do lobbying. And I think this is a, this is a real problem to, uh, to overcome. And about the issue of time, I don't have the, if, if I did have the answer, I could write a book on this and apply <laughs> to the movements. I think we need to expect, like, we need to experiment, but uh, I would say that the, the question of efficacy uh, is crucial from this point of view because the problem is uh, people who work, uh, I'm very triggered on this, I'm sorry, but uh, people who work eight, nine hours a day uh, are not possibly motivated to come to meetings if they don't think that these meetings will change their life in a material way. And uh, so, if it, so maybe somebody uh, will come to meetings just, you know, to socialize, yeah, it's, it's a possibility. Like, People can do that, and I'm sure that in the movement there is also this element. You know, people like social life, like having a social life, and uh, uh, especially American society is so fragmented. And but it's true that the movement provided for us also, also a space of socialization, and it's also a beautiful thing. Uh, but the problem is that uh, if you think of uh, of uh, movements which are able really of uh, uh, seeing the protagonism of mass of people who live in conditions of uh, Exploitation, precarity, precariousness, uh, underemployment, unemployment, so on. Just taking into account that uh, they are not going to come to meetings just to, uh, because meetings are nice and just because they can express their voice and so on. It's so that the problem of efficacy. So, what kind of decision that we are making, how we are making them, and uh, where uh, they are going to bring us, I think is crucial in order to motivate uh, people to, to to take part. And then, of course, there is an element of uh, just rules that you. Uh, that you adopt. And, you know, so forms of uh, discussion and uh, functioning and uh, decision-making processes which are not time-consuming. Uh, whereas in the moment, I think they were extremely time-consuming. Like to make then decisions which are, which were, were uh, often very small decisions in the sense of, you know, decisions which do not, do not have any kind of uh, um, effectiveness <laughs> and impact on, uh, on people's life. Or, you know, like discussing uh, for five hours uh, about how to spend the money, say if, whether we should buy metro cards or not. <laughs> this is a real problem, and maybe it's, it's trivial, but I think, and uh, there are problems which can be partially solved in, on a theoretical level, and, uh, but not, should be solved on a practical level, this is by, through experience, uh, through experience. Andy, would you like to add anything? I think I'd just like to really thank you for <laughs> organising a great conference. I've really, uh, enjoyed it immensely, and it's, it's been a great conference. So, um, in the interest of time and moving towards a, a beverage. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the interest of beverage consumption, thank you very much. Take <laughs> <laughs>
la 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 la